Hi guys, it's Blackie and Bear for Old Ways number 23. And this is going to be a conglomeration. Uh, in previous video, we talked about processing some cast iron. So Bear has brought a Dutch oven minus a lid, and I went and found a at a garage junk sale a, a chicken fryer that needs to be reworked. Both of these need to be burned out. But we want to talk about it first with you before we actually went over and start doing it. And then once we get the fire going, which we're going to use charcoal for this, it don't have to be big. We're just looking for a heat source that's going to burn out any impurities on the metal. Now in this case, this thing smells like it probably had a cat pee in it or something. And that's the reason it was $2 at the estate sale. This thing looks like it's been thrown under a barn for 50 years and it's rusty as all get out. And we'll show you up close in a minute, but this one can be brought back now. Bears. Well, one thing about his, this is going to be a really good example of how you, you can find this stuff. It doesn't matter the condition, because with a little bit of elbow grease and creative engineering, you can put it back into service. So, I mean, he's at an advantage because he got the lid with the frying pan. Okay, so at least that much of it was protected. But anyway, to mine, I got this from a somewhat dubious source. Won't, won't go into the details there, but I don't know if you can see it on camera, but right down here, there's what appears to be old cooking oil. Hold on, I'll zoom in on it. All right. So you can see it real good. Okay, got it. All right, right, right inside here on the bottom, mm -hmm. there's some oil. It's it's soft enough you can put your, put your fingernail in it, but I don't know what it is. If it's if it's old goopy motor oil, then you know I have to find I have to find a nice uh, flour to put in here. But we're gonna try. We're gonna go on the assumption that it is vegetable oil that has gotten just clumped up over the over the years and. Uh, Try to bring it back to life. That size right there, zooming back out, I remember that size being used a lot yes. for fish fries yes. on the creek bank and stuff. This is, this is not my biggest Dutch oven. It's, it's probably a, oh, my one mid-size. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is a lodge, so it's It is a made. lodge, so it, yeah, it's a And it's got, and I'll show you up close. So just to see how bad things can be, it's got spiky spider eggs, which is probably black widow. Of course, they're dead. And then it's got a very heavy coating of rust. But now when you look on the inside, you can see that black. That means this was used in cooking, and that is a coating from seasoning. So this was a cooking vessel. This has not been completely, you know, out of that realm that dang long. And then the main pot of it, I don't see a maker's mark on it. I have no doubt it's American though, but it's got this big stain that smells like cat pee. <coughs> but all of this can be brushed out, scrubbed off, burned out, etc., to get it going. Now, I know somebody's going to say, oh my God, cat pee. I intentionally, when I saw this thing and realized what that was, I wanted to show you how far you could bring something back. Because the bottom line is anything biological. This thing's been used as a rat cage. <laughs> I mean, whatever. As long as you clean it up and you burn it out, the fire is going to purify it and get rid of any biological component. It's going to burn it out, carbonize it, get rid of it, sterilize it, then washing it very completely, etc. Once we get to that stage, the stages of this are, and I brought brushes, is I'm going to take the wire brush and I'm going to knock the surface rust off of it, especially around the handle and stuff like that. Once that's done, and of course I'll rinse it out, it'll go onto the fire. 
Let the fire do its work of sterilizing it. Get rid of any other impurities in there. Carbonize them and get rid of them, etc. You get sick from biological things because it's still got some bio, it's still alive. So once it's fried, burned, boiled, gone, it's nothing. So all of that contamination will be gone out of here. The thing that we have to be concerned about is chemical. Right. That's the reason he's concerned about that. We, I, I agree with him. I think it's cooking foot oil. But until we get it hot and get to see what that oil does, if it's a cooking oil and stuff like that, you'll know when you smell the, the smell. If it is a motor oil, you'll know when we smell the smell. Also, if I remember right, cooking oil will, will give off a black smoke. And motor oil will give off a blue smoke. Yep, true. So we've got that to go by too. Mm -hmm. But we'll sterilize them, clean them up, get them going. Now, if it had been painted, can you burn the paint off? Yes. Uh, if it's really, 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 really old lead-based paint, and you can go to a lot of the paint shops, they've got the tester thing you just rub, and you can tell if it is. If lead-based paint, pass on it. Don't risk it. Yeah, it's real hard to get all that lead out. Um, my dad painted most, well, I got my cast iron from my dad, who was a collector, and he painted it with, uh, non-lead-based paint in the late 70s to preserve it because he, he was never going to use it. He camped at the hotel with room service and uh, of course I, I didn't do that. But anyway, that having been said, uh, by the late 70s they had taken lead out of paints. So if you have something that was done in prior to say 1976, then... Anything in the last 30 years you're good. Yeah. Or even the next, last 40. But yeah, we're going to burn this one out. We're going to burn that one out. And give us a minute to get set up, and we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. Right quick. I'm going to take my, this is just one of those barbecue grill stainless steel brush. I'm going to knock this surface rust off. Now, I don't see any cracks, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm doing this. Now see that black? That's old seasoning, which tells me again, this was actively being used for cooking. You're not going to hurt it doing this. This is cast iron. That means it's a solid hunk of iron. All this red is, is simply oxidized iron, red oxide, which means it's trying to turn back into iron ore what it was made out of. By doing this, I will knock all this surface stuff off and allow me to see any cracks that may be in the body. So what I'm going to do I have now done that. I'm going to just take me a cloth or something and get the surface off of it, like I said. And I'm looking for crack, any kind of line or whatever. I don't see any. That looks okay. Now that handle, same thing. I ain't gonna work that inside because I'm gonna just straight burn that out. But the bottom of it, if the reason this got turned out in the barn is because it cracked, I want to see now before I do all the work. The number eight, ten and a half inch, or ten and ten and five eighths. I call this surface rust off. Now, if it is cracked, I wouldn't mess with it any further than that. It becomes a planter at that point because it's just not worth the effort 
to try to salvage it and try to weld it or whatever. Remember, this is going to be subjected to heat. And any kind of welding or patching or whatever will cause it to recrack. It's the uniformity of the casting that guarantees that it's going to be usable. Almost. I want to do this outside like me and Bear are doing. I do not see a crack. Look around the handle where it joins. Make sure that there's no crack right there because that is a weak spot. Usually these get dropped or something. Alright, what's that right here? It was not. Okay. Now we put it on a fire. We'll be right back in just a minute. Alright, here we go. You see that Bear has put charcoal into his and got it going. Now he's soaking it in mine. And I got the lid down there too. He's put a little bit in the lid. For the record. Yeah. Because you light your grill to eat with this and you use it to essentially cook with it, it's not going to hurt this. Yeah. It'll, it, all, it'll all burn off and burn away. That's the whole idea. This is going to just burn. We're looking for <laughs> fire and heat. Now this, of course, will add some component from the, the charcoal itself in there but the thing about it is it's the heat we're wanting to help sterilize because the any residue that's left by the charcoal we can scrub out of there that's not a problem all right we're gonna let it get cooking Now it's just a time thing, guys. Letting it burn, get it good and hot. Now, I know it goes without saying, but once you get it hot, you got to let it cool. Don't put water on it. It'll break it. The fastest way to crack cast iron is get it really, really hot and then put it into cold water. It'll crack it. Every time. Yeah, and you learn that at home that whenever you're cooking in it, your boiling stuff in it, well, the highest it can get is 212 degrees. This fire can be three or four or five hundred degrees, a thousand degrees, see, and that's what it's doing. It's going to sterilize those bodies, burn out that original seasoning, and heat the entire pot uniformly. It'll make that rust easier to get off as well. Also, we're using charcoal today because of where we're at, okay? We're back here on the farm shooting, but don't do this when you're in the woods, okay? Do like we're doing, okay? Several days out, like shameless plug, Blackie's event is coming up in uh, about a month from this week. Mm -hmm. I think actually it's a month from next week. Yeah. So we're five weeks out of his event at this point while we're filming. Um, do it now. Uh, we, we both encourage everybody to come to the event, and I believe he's going to be having some things on his channel for those who've never been, Directions In. Mm -hmm. um, it's not hard to find. Just pay attention to what he's telling you because there's, there's one right-hand turn that if you miss it, you're going to wind up on the other side of the state forest. Yeah. Now, that's just the thick and the thin of it. When you come off the paved road, you're coming onto a dirt road. Do not get off that dirt road. You're going to have a lot of roads coming into that road. Make no turns. Keep going straight until you see the sign on the left-hand side. And I'll, I have a drive-through video where I drive in. It's four miles in, so you can see it clearly. But there'll be a sign pointing across the road. You make a right-hand turn, and you go up the hill, 
and you go around this agricultural field on the back side of it, it drops into the lake. Right. It, it kind of make it doesn't make logical sense to go uphill to a lake. You think I want to go downhill, but it's actually going up and then over that hill is what it is. We have a lot of people call up going, where are you at? And they're on the back side because they tried to use GPS. And GPS will put you on the back side of the food plot. Somebody actually got lost a couple of years ago and saw dinosaurs. They were so far back in the woods. <laughs> yeah. He said, I saw brontosauruses. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, though. Um, if you're able, please join us at the event, and um, we would love to see you. You know that that I'm planning on bringing a couple pieces of cast iron because we'll have a big campfire then. Yeah. And that'd be a good time to bring it and <coughs> put those pieces of cast iron on there and burn them out, reseason them at camp. So when I come home, I'll have freshly seasoned Dutch oven. Now, talk about when do you need to reseason? Well, if you, as you use it, it's going to build up seasoning. <clears throat> if you have something go completely sideways and it starts eating like, okay, okay here's, here's an interesting thing. When, you, when you're cooking using tomatoes, or tomato products and cast iron, the acid that's in the thing will actually eat your eat your uh, liner out. Um, it's it's not something that just sits there bubbling, looking like a science experiment that's gone horribly wrong. But over time, the acids that are in the tomato-based product or or any acid-based food will eat off your your seasoning. Um, it's it all, basically carbon. Yeah, it's, it's exactly what it is. It, it's carbon, and so the carbon itself is a non-stick surface, but uh, lemon, anything lemon, anything tomato, uh, orange juice, any of those acids, it's okay to use it, but yes. realize that if I don't want to make a punch bowl out of a Dutch oven because it will take the lining the line out of it. Yeah, yeah like, like you say, it's, good. it's okay to use it. Fine. Just be sure you clean it well after you get done. And he mentioned the fact that the, the liner, the seasoning in, in cast iron is carbon. Well, do go back to your high school chemistry. That's what a diamond's made of. That's why it's so valuable to keep your, your layer of hardened carbon on the inside of these pots and pans uh, active and viable. But to answer your question, um, it would be case by case on when to reseason. If you can see seasoning coming up, if you use dish detergent, it starts to, flaking off. Yeah, if you if you start seeing it chipping or or something like that, then yeah, it's time to reseason. Um, I have a very very dear lady who uh, used to wash her cast iron in. Uh, with Dawn dishwashing detergent every time she used it. And I kept saying, no, you don't need to do that. And then she realized that she was seasoning her cast iron about every two or three times that she used it. Yeah. And now she doesn't do that. She dry cleans hers like I do. Well, I mean, you take it and as soon as I get done pulling the food out of it, I put water right back into it, put it back on the heat. Bring it to a boil. Um, That'll soften anything you left in the pot. And then that is taken over to the sink, and that hot water is dumped out, and I just go with clean, hot water usually, and a little light rag and go around. And if there's any hard little something, I'll take a fingernail or something and break it loose. Once that's good, just put hot water back in it, put it back on the stove, bring it to a boil. You sterilize it then, dump the water out, let it cool, I normally put a, just a drop of oil in there and smear it all the way out and then put it back in the cabinet. It's good. You know, that's it. Yeah, my, my youngest son, who is an excellent cook, let me add, is, is notorious for when he cooks, like particularly eggs, he will leave egg residue in the skillet. Yeah. He won't clean it out. And 
in cases like that, I put water in mine to soften it. Put it on low heat. It doesn't have to come to a boil. You just want to soften the stuff that's there and give it a few minutes to, to start steaming. Now let you know it's coming up. And you can generally take, I have my trusty handy dandy uh, Blackie Thomas pot scraper right here in the back of my truck for when we get finished here. Yeah, the uh, broom sage pot scrubbers. Always 21. Yeah, always 21. Go look at it. That one of the reasons we made them up is for this type of stuff. Yeah, but I have my very own Blackbird pot scrubber. <laughs> And uh, oh boy, <laughs> you know how many people have bugged me wanting the Blackbird cookbook now? The Blackie and Bear cookbook. I am gonna, I am gonna beat you with a knife plow. <laughs> oh, we uh, that that was a joke, but you know, I, I appreciate your interest, <laughs> but well, back to seasoning, yeah. You know, I just, you, you go in and once it's soft, I take my, my handy dandy Blackbird pot scrubber and I do this number and most of it will come straight out. You know, I go back in, hit it with a paper towel and get whatever is not stuck, unstuck, just scrub it down some more and then I'll polish it off with a little bit of, of uh, salt, coarse salt. And uh, I need to go get some some of that sterilized sand that I was telling you about. Um, you can get it in the pet department or in the toy department of your local big box and use it as an abrasive. And it will, it will actually do everything that it's supposed to do. It, that pot will come out looking brand new. Have you ever seen the uh, hot sand Turkish coffee? Uh -huh. What they do is they've got a cast iron cauldron and it's full of sand. There's a blowtorch on that sucker. <coughs> and there's nothing there but sand. And they'll take this little on a stick copper carafe yeah. and they put the coffee stuff in and they just push it down in the sand. One, two, three, that thing goes to a boil. Because yeah. that sand is probably about a thousand degrees and they pull it up, let it the bubble stop just so they can push it back down in the sand. Do it like three times, they pour it in a cup. And I saw that, but, and I'm hearing all this stuff about um, sand batteries in your wood stove. Same idea. You just put a container of dry sand up there and let that heat up, and that'll radiate heat to the tent. As the wood fire dies down, it's still radiating heat. That's yeah. thermal mass. And then so, but I was looking at that the other day going, you know, cooking techniques that we can do on the sand. I mean, you can take a steak and lay it directly on the coach. Yeah. I've cooked like that many times. In fact, at the uh, last gathering, I cooked the steak for uh, Trinity. She wanted to try caveman steak. And uh, I cooked it like that. And cooking on bare coal, I like about five minutes a side, which means it's basically tartar. It's nice and seared on the outside, but it is pure raw in the middle of it. That's how I like steak. But I like steak about five minutes on the side. We figured out Trinity wanted more like 12 minutes to a side to cook it a little longer. So yeah. you got to learn your coals, and et cetera. But I was thinking, you know, hot sand on the steak. Get that stuff hot enough, lay it up there. You think it'd stick. It won't stick. Because laying it down on that hot coal, it don't, it, the coal will stick to you. Pull it up, you got to knock the coal off of it. And there's all this ash. You just wrap it up with aluminum foil. And give it 10 minutes to rest and you open it up, there ain't no ash, nothing, and there's this gravy. Yeah. It's, it's magic. And it tastes really, really good. Sounds good. It is. I, I'd have to be somewhere in the middle. I don't want my steak raw in the middle. I don't want it charred all the way to the middle either. I learned to eat meat basically in the medium to raw range. And that's how I prefer it. It's tender, it's easy to chew. And uh, and then I got out in the world and I found out people like carbon 14 dated steaks at shoe leather. Why do I want to eat that? You know, I remember going to a fancy restaurant once and when I was doing my bit with Enterprise Electronics and doing government contracting stuff. And of course, when you brought in a multi million dollar radar, 
the engineers, they got an expense account. If they get to take you to lunch, yeah. they can write it off. So you're going to where they want to go. And they wanted these fancy steaks and seafood and everything else, of course. Okay. We was we was in a place in Boston, and it was going to be about seventy. And this was in the eighties, and that was going to be seventy-five to eighty dollars, my portion for that meal. They're paying for it, and that steak came out, and oh, it was just running in gravy and everything else, and it was about as cooked as shoe leather in the middle of it, and it was like trying to chew shoe leather to me, and oh, they're all bragging about how oh, it tasted wonderful. The guy had the seasoning and herbs right. But he don't know how to cook a steak, you know. So it just like I might as well have been boiling my shoes as far as I was concerned. But everybody's got their own preference and reference. Now, while we're waiting on this to finish cooking up a little bit, it's going to take a little bit. Uh, Justin Coon put forth the question for us doing always on tool sets. So I thought we might talk about that a minute. When uh, I was a young man, I turned 16, my granddaddy took me to the pawn shop. Right. And he went through the boxes of sockets and stuff, and he made me up an entire set of regular and deep well sockets, both a quarter inch, a three eighths inch drive set, or an adapter, I should say, if I could do the little and the big one. And uh, a set of wrenches, combination wrenches, and of course screwdriver, screwdriver, a pry bar of some kind, crescent wrench, two or three other tools. But he said that's your basic tool kit. Now that's going to handle about all your basic needs around the house or whatever. And a man needs his own set of tools. Now these were cheap Taiwanese tools and stuff like that he said. But he did get the half inch, the 9 sixteenths. 3 8 and the 7 16 were craftsmen. Everything, the best ones they could find are a snap on, best ones in the box. The rest were cheap tools. He said if you break a cheap one, replace it with a good one. Right. But you don't need a high quality 11 16 because how often are you going to need an 11 16 You know, if you use a tool enough that you break it, replace it with a good tool. Right. And when I was going through my <clears throat> tool sets back several months ago, I still have some of them Taiwanese sockets from when I was 16 that I've never needed this 11 30 second socket. If I have, it's only got used a handful of times. Yeah. But uh, in, a, in your average toolkit, I, we were talking a little bit earlier, for a long time I've been wanting to, to put together what's called a Pioneer kit for my truck to just carry in the back of it sealed up in, a, in a, some sort of container, dry container. Um, we've been down to uh, to the uh, surplus store. What's, uh, what's the name of it? Kaufman Military Surplus yes. in Sampson, Alabama. Yes, we've been to Sampson to Kaufman's uh, looking. And I had found some boxes, but that was about the time that I had some big changes going on in my life that you may or may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I uh, I got custody of two of my grandchildren, but that's a different story for a different day. But in your in your basic pioneer kit, you have a an axe, what's called a mattock, which on one side is a pick, like a pick, uh, pig head, mm -hmm. and on the other side, is uh, like an ad's head, or it's a, a hoe head, head. Or yeah. hoe head, and then it fits on its own handle. But you got the axe, the add the mattock, and there's also um, provisions for a bow saw, and you need a jack of some description if you're going to use it in a vehicle. Um, well, now hold on, like Socrates said. Let us discuss what we're discussing. Yeah. Okay. You're talking about a Pioneer kit to keep in a vehicle right. for going out and staying in the woods, etc. So, that's what we're talking about. You're saying an axe of some form, 
I agree. A saw of some form, right. I agree. I'm not that big on a matic, you know. Um, I'd rather have a good hoe over a matic down here in our dirt. Uh, a pickaxe is actually preferred. Um, now that German entrenching tool I got that's got the spike off the back of it, because our red clay down here, when it, once it's dry and hard, it's concrete. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was talking about. My my uh, guy was the old World War II pioneer kits that you see on the back of tanks mm -hmm. or on trucks or jeeps. <clears throat> You'll see these tools that are positioned all the way around the vehicle. That's what I'm. That's my mindset. Is that World War II based modern equivalent? Uh, and you can go back and do your own research on what you would want. Uh, I've even seen them. They had grease guns in, uh, in them. Uh, it can be very elaborate or it can be very simple. Um, now define grease gun as in lubrication or M3 grease gun 45 <laughs> ACP. Well, that there were both. Okay, but we're talking grease gun as in lubricant. Yeah, because those guys getting out there in the field and yeah. needing it. Well, we're not we're not talking about M3. That's one of my favorite things to ask these young guys. They get the, they get these big four-wheel drive trucks and they're going this and that. And I ask them, how many parts have you broke this month? <laughs> they they carry portable welders. They carry grease. They carry two by fours. They carry chain. They carry all this stuff because they're expecting to break this vehicle before yeah. they get home. Yeah, I've already got uh, chain and tie downs in an ammo can in the back of my truck. Y'all had money. Us poor kids couldn't afford any of that crap. We had a come along <laughs> and a I've, shovel and I've, an ax. I've carried one. Well, see, there you, there's your Pioneer kid. Yeah, but the shovel was for when you got stuck, you had to dig down. Yes. The ax was for chopping down and splitting trees to make the boards to get you up and out. And the right. come along was to hook to a tree. And if you were really lucky, you had a snatch block that was quite often was some sort of, it was the uh, harmonic balancer off of a dead engine that somebody welded shop had built a plate around and put a bolt through and then had a, we could run a strap in there and strap it to a tree. The first ratchet strap I ever saw um, was for that. It was somebody had taken the harmonic balancer off of about a 55 Ford and that was the, the, the pulley because you could hook the cable through where the fan belt had ran. Yeah. And then there was a, a bolt went through it and it was just a piece of heavy steel plate that the <coughs> belt bent in that kind of shape, put the pulley in, and then you ran that. And they uh, sanded the edges around so it wouldn't cut the belt. And then there was about a 10 foot long piece of three inch wide webbing yeah. with a buckle. And I, the first time I ever saw one of them was we were stuck in the middle of nowhere and this family member had opened up the toolbox and brought that out and pointed at this tree and said, go hook that to the tree. And I had no clue. I went and tied the, a knot. I did not know how to use the ratchet. Yeah. I knew how to tie a knot. And so I got up there and I tied a knot on the back side of the tree and he hooked to it. Had that four-wheel drive GMC bogged down, boy. Huh. Oh my God. And so he said, start using the come along. So I started tightening up He's inching and rocking so that I can drag him out. We finally got it out of there, and then he figured out you couldn't untie them knots I put in. <laughs> well, it didn't come loose. Had to cut his strap with the axe to get that snatch block back. Here I was hoping there was a block tied to a tree growing into the tree all these years later. Oh, it probably is somewhere, but it wasn't by me. We but could yeah, for, that. <coughs> for years, uh, We've carried come-alongs in our toolboxes as well. They're they're inexpensive and they do the job. You know, can will they pull a, a Abrams tank out of the mud? No. But who knows with enough leverage and enough come-alongs, you might do it. Nothing is impossible given enough time and resources. Yeah. But at the same time, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> And I think, not even with duct tape. As I've said in a couple of earlier videos, the way I was taught to use a vehicle was 
you go in on two-wheel drive. If you had to go in on four-wheel drive, you're being stupid from the word go. Go in in two-wheel drive because if you see something you can't get through in two-wheel drive, you don't need to go back there. Yep. But four-wheel drive is to get you out whenever the two-wheel drive ain't enough and you do get stuck in two-wheel drive. Then you go to the four-wheel drive. If that ain't enough, then you've got, to, like you say, your Pioneer kit, and now you're going to get all muddy. Yep. Which serves you right for being there in the oh, first Oh, my God. I have, I have seen a Ford pickup up to the mirrors on the side, yeah. and I had to go down in the mud underneath the hook to the frame. You can't shovel the mud out. It's soup. Yeah. So you just have to take a deep breath and go down in mud that was this deep on me and just submerge in the mud and go under there and hook by a field and come back up and get a breath of air. You were the, the swamp monster at that point. I didn't get that truck stuck, but I was the one assigned to get it out of there by family members. So You were the lowest man on the totem. I had the intelligence to know how to do it, and I was young enough they could order me to do it, and they didn't have to go get in that mud, <laughs> you know. I hot wired more than one tractor too to go in there and pull something loose. Know your land. Yeah. Know the know the area you're going into. Don't go in cold because you may wind up diving in mud. Yeah. And there've been a lot of vehicles that have been lost where they get in there and turn over whatever. There was a, a place I know of. They'd gone in there with a bulldozer. And what he was trying to do, that bulldozer was actually change the course of a creek. He took it and he cut a new channel. Yeah. And it flowed through this one section and he wanted to build a, a barn down there for cattle, but that water went through, it'd come out and go through there. And so he wanted to cut into the hill right here and all he had to do is change it at this point about 10 feet to the right and then let it go that way. That was his idea, taking this big bow out of it. And so he took the bulldozer and he'd cut a new channel and got it up in there well flash forward about a month and a half and now it's got about oh eight inches of water in it and a stepbrother of mine and them are out there riding around and he thinks it's the road that's been cut and he decides he wants to go up that road oops well he had that big old four-wheel drive ford f-150 hallelujah it can go anywhere my truck can do anything in the universe and he's slinging rooster tails of mud 20 feet high. And he, wah, 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 wah. Well, at the end of it, it stops being this prepared thing, and it's the creek. Yeah. That was a 20-foot deep hole. <clears throat> and so he, wah, 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 and off he went. And so I get woke up at about 4 o'clock in the morning by my dad telling me I'm going to go help my stepbrother get the truck out. And when we got there, you could see about two inches of tailgate sticking up out of the water. The rest of the truck is at this angle down there. Wow. Here's a come along. Right. It took a whole lot more to come along to get that thing out. We had to go up there and talk the guy that had made this thing into letting us use bulldozer to come back there. Then I had to play U-boat commander and go down and hook to the truck I had to run the bulldozer because he couldn't figure out how to run it. Here I am, 13 years old, and I'm being told to drive a D8 bulldozer. Welcome to the South. You know, I had an idea because I've been around machinery my whole life. But sitting there figuring out what all the levers did and then having to back it down all, all the way down there, hook to it. Why didn't the guy come up there and run it himself? Because he was in the bed with two broke legs. He had had a car accident and had two broke legs, and he could not run the dozer. But he knew me and said, you can run it. Go on up there, Blackie. Just back it up. <laughs> yeah. About uh, four years ago, I was out in the county and uh, at a place called Thames's Bridge. You remember things? Oh, yeah. Well, I was watching some high school kids and their Jeeps. And generally speaking, the, the Whitewater Creek at that point 
is not that deep. It's probably axle deep. So they were just they were daring each other to see who could do what with their Jeep. And I don't know how much beer was involved in this decision, but this one kid, they were all parked on the bank underneath the bridge, and he said he got in his Jeep, fired it up, and started driving down the creek until he hit one of those holes that Blackie was talking about, and suddenly he's swimming. Jeep's not. He is. Yeah. And he was about a half a mile down the creek. Yeah. Because we, I watched him. My my son and his friend watched him, and it it was bumping along and bumping along and bumping along and bumping, and then all of a sudden it just went whoop and died. Water is a great equalizer. It's always level. You don't know what's underneath it. Hey, baby, come here. All right, I'm gonna turn it off a minute, and we'll get back to it after it burned a little bit. Okay, we've now been burning out for like 45 minutes or something like that. And get my glove back on. Now, dumping out the cold and making my brush, I go ahead and it just falls off. All the rust and scale is just falling off. Just like that. stainless steel wire brush like you'd get for cleaning your barbecue grill. And all that carbon is coming right out. That's a nice clean surface for me to scrub up. That's all the, the seasoning that we were talking about earlier. Yep. All that black carbon, scaly carbon stuff. Yep. I got a little bit of seasoning left right in the middle. I'm not worried about that but I don't see any cracks. Now that I've heated it up, it really should expand yeah. and show. So any show surface sanding, well. I'll be able to do in a minute because this is going to try to rust right in front of your eyes. I'm expecting that. The lid came out perfect. Now just go around and knock all this scale off just like that. Remember, all that heat goes all the way through. Yeah. So there's as much heat on the outside as there is on the inside. Right. Now, let me show you his pot. See how that turned out nice and pretty? Remember all that caked up oil and stuff? Completely burned out. In fact, it's kind of shiny metal down there in the middle. It's still hot. So that's ready to clean up once it cools off. We'll, excuse me. As soon as it cools off, then we'll wash it. Then we'll oil it, then we'll put it back on the heat and start seasoning it, like we've talked about before. One thing I would recommend about the, the stuff that's in the bottom of a blackie skillet. Yeah. Take, you know, you can get those rotary brushes for, for drills. Uh-huh. I might just take one of those, put it in there and hit it. It's got a little more, more horsepower on it knock that stuff loose. You might have one just laying around in your shop. I've got a Dremel tool right now with that kind of get yeah. on it. Yeah. And I get home, I'll just zzz, zzz, and that's it's, gone. It's done. Yeah. So y'all saw what we started with. And now you see what we ended up with. It's not hard. Hmm. We, we preach constantly, this is not hard. Let me move. So, we burned it out using charcoal. That got that built up oil out on his side and all that contamination that was in my side is now gone. Now it's just bare metal. And yes, it's going to rust. Expect that. You got the oil out of it now. So now whenever this thing cools down, it's going to be orange with rust. That's fine. Put it in the sink. Scrub it in the sink with your standard cleansers and stuff. Or actually what I'd use is salt. But put it in the sink and wash it. If you got a little rough area, hit it with a little emery cloth or something. Wet, dry sandpaper like you go get from the automotives. Come in and say, I want some wet, dry emery cloth. And that means it can get wet. And just sitting there by hand, scrub it. Yeah, this is one of the few times that I would say use Dawn dishwashing soap on it. Yeah. And, and clean it up really good. And should be the last time. 
uh -huh. used under normal circumstances that you would use Dawn dishwashing soap. Now once it's dry, once it's clean, what I like to do is dry it off with a paper towel and go ahead and coat the whole thing with a little bit of cooking oil and then I slide it into an oven at about say 200 and I like to deep soak, yeah. slow. So something like peanut oil, cooking oil, olive oil is one of my favorites. Coat the whole thing inside and out, let it sit there. I will sometimes put two butter knives down on a cookie sheet and set it on top to get an airflow underneath. See, and just go through and then build that seasoning up. After I've got my first run of seasoning on it, I'm gonna take it out, reapply, put it back in. Over what, take three hours. Yeah. You know, two, I like to go like two or three hours of it. Just slowly keep checking on it, come back and re-oil it. Yeah. Let it cool down and the first thing I do is I'm gonna boil water in it. Right. I generally will, uh, when, they, when I get them washed and be sure that when you get them cleaned up, you dry them off. That's that's imperative. Don't dry. To get you some paper towels and wipe them out on the inside, and then, like he was saying, put you some oil in there. While you're doing this, you can turn your oven on to like 200 degrees and let it build up. And then, when you get your pot oiled and you're ready to go, stick it in the 200 degree oven. Let it sit there for a few minutes to kind of get warmed up, and then turn the oven off and let it soak down cold. Mm -hmm. And that will do wonders because you know you, you're, your your pot's going to be up at 200 degrees, and it's going to stay there, and it's going to drop incrementally with the oven mm -hmm. as yeah. the oven cools what off. What you're doing is you're heating up the metal so the pores open up so that oil gets sucked in. Exactly. And then as it cools, that oil is in there. You haven't made carbon yet; you've made it oil. Now, whenever I start cooking with it, initially it's not nonstick. But now every time I cook with it, I'm going to cook, fry, I prefer to fry or boil in it to begin with. And then after I've had a few cooks with that, I'm getting a layer in there. Now I'll come in and risk something like eggs or cheese or whatever and start cooking. But each time I do it, I, like I said, I take the food out, I put water back in, I warm it up, I get any food scraps out of it, I towel it dry, put a drop of oil and go back around it and it's done. It builds it up. Now it's going to take what, five or ten meals before you get a, a, a good layer started. And then but now six months from now, you got that sheet of black on it. Absolutely. Dude, you can throw each, anything there and it ain't going to stick. Yeah, each time you use it, it's going to season. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is use it often. Just use it. That's what I'll Just be doing. Just use it. Just and, use it. And if you ever notice a really loved, used uh, iron skillet, the outside of it has got it's got seasoning on it like that thick. Yeah. The real the really old ones. And it doesn't hurt it. Doesn't affect the food. Doesn't affect it. Just keep using it. Keep uh, at it. You always rinse it out and then put a drop of oil. Go back in, just take a paper towel and smear that one drop as far as you can go. And uh, when I pull it out of the cabinet, if I haven't used it for a day or two, I step up the sink, I just rinse it. I ain't gotta clean it, I just gotta rinse any dust that might have got in it. Yeah and go back to cooking my high use stuff sleeps in my oven mm -hmm. i'll put it on the rack upside down and my i can get you know three or four different things on the top rack three or four things on the bottom rack and they just sleep in my oven mm -hmm. does it get to be a pain in the butt when you want to use your oven yeah but you know it is what it is pull them out put them on the counter put them out put them on the counter well anything else brother now, right now, we'll we'll be doing some some extensions as we get these things coming up to speed. We'll bring them back and revisit them. Yeah, we'll come back and we'll show you what yeah. we're doing and how we're doing and how it's progressing. This this one, this old ways is a is a uh, is a, a continuing e event. I mean, we're going to mm -hmm. keep this one rolling for a while. Yeah, because next time we need to cook some. Yeah, definitely. I got to get a little bit of seasoning in that thing, and we're going to do a do some frying in it and I'll show you some tricks I learned about frying. It turned out beautifully. The Dutch that he's got without the lid um, and you can buy replacement lids online if you get something like that. Uh, like I said, that's the size I always saw was for the fish fry. That yeah. road with the boat where you're getting off on the bank going to do a fish fry, that's what was used for deep frying fish. Yeah, I've got a, I've got one that's 
slightly bigger than that with an oven or the lid for it that I use all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is probably going to be like going camping and making stew in. Mm -hmm. And just, no, it doesn't require, if I, if I need a lid, I've got the other lid to just pop over on it. That or heavy aluminum pole yeah. works good. Absolutely. I bake biscuits and them things before. And I've, I've got a trick up my sleeve for steaks that I want to show you. Make it sit there and dance in it. No, it's oh. a secret, but I'll show All right, you. he'll show you. I'll show you. All right, guys, we're going to end it here. Thanks for watching, and do us a favor and hit that like, share, and subscribe if you happen before you go. And Bear will have a video on his channel. A new video. A brand new video on his channel this week, so go check it out. Till next time, guys, I'm Blackie. And Bear. Wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.